Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have a great panel, as you can see, and I'm delighted to have the privilege of introducing them to you. Today, we will hear about federal procurement and how the federal government has been instrumental in the development and adoption of sustainable products, especially how the EPA helped launch the movement to identify and purchase EPEAT registered electronics, how OFPP coordinates coordinate sustainable purchasing with other procurement policy, and how, how they also uh, develop government-wide multiple award contracts and category management to streamline acquisition, which actually helped agencies achieve a 95% purchasing goal for EP products. We'll also hear from the Department of Energy who continues to identify and verify products that meet energy efficient requirements and standards for federal purchasing, including electronics. But before we get to our panel today, I'd like to introduce our host from the Global Electronics Council, CEO, Nancy Gillis, who is a recognized leader in sustainable and circular procurement and supply chains and has more than 20 years experience leveraging sustainability to increase competitiveness, reduce risk, and foster innovation in both public and private sector organizations. Prior to joining GEC, Nancy was the global lead for resilient and responsible supply chains with Ernst & Young and managed sustainable procurement engagements for Fortune 100 companies. Prior to that, when I met Nancy, she was at the General Services Administration as the director of GSA's Federal Supply Chain Office responsible for expanding the use of sustainability criteria and eco labels in federal procurement. Nancy has a graduate degree in communications technology from Georgetown University. And as the CEO of GEC, Nancy is leading the role as a founding partner of the Circular Electronics Partnership and the launch of GEC's purchaser commitment, which is I'm sure what she's gonna tell us about in her open, opening remarks, so thanks. And welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much, Cindy. And we are absolutely thrilled to be hosting this webinar today. And we are excited to join all of you in listening to the fantastic speakers who you'll be hearing from shortly. But first, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to the Global Electronics Council for those of you who may not know us. We are a mission-driven nonprofit organization, and we seek to achieve a world that is more sustainable and more just. And the way that we seek to do that is to leverage the power of the purchaser, hence the focus of the webinar today. Next slide. Now, you'll hear a lot about one of the tools that we provide to purchasers, our EP Eco Label, but we also provide some other resources freely to really help purchasers buy more credible, sustainable IT products and services. And why are we focused on helping purchasers? Well, it's because we understand that by helping institutional purchasers, public and private sector, in buying credible technology, what we're doing is we're stimulating the necessary demand signal to incentivize the producers to make those products and services. And as I mentioned, you'll hear a little bit about our eco label, EPEAT, which we are proud to manage and which we're proud to say is the most used technology focused eco label in the world today. But also, there are these other resources we offer to purchasers globally. One of the ones is our purchaser guides. Now, these guides address either sustainability impacts, such as human labor rights or technologies that are of great interest to purchasers. Now, we just launched in April of this year our second version of our purchaser guide on how purchasers can address human and labor rights impacts within the technology supply chain. And we are also addressing how do purchasers buy circularity, since many organizations are focused on moving towards being part of the circular economy. And we also, earlier on, and are planning to update next year, launched a purchaser guide on cloud services, recognizing that so many organizations are putting an increasing percentage of their IT budgets towards cloud services. Next slide. 
But what I mentioned is what we are well known for, especially in the federal purchaser space, is our EP Eco label. As you see here, we cover most types of technology that a federal worker would ever need. But we're also expanding the EP Eco label to really be inclusive of technologies that are important to our world today. As you see, we now address photovoltaic modules and inverters. Why? Because you know the benefits that renewable energy has for our energy needs. But what we believe is you shouldn't benefit from renewables when they're not on a sustainable base. So that's why one of the leading renewable energy sources is of course solar. And that's why we now cover photovoltaic modules and inverters. Starting next year, you'll also see us having a vibrant category for network infrastructure. We are an organization that's focused on sustainability for a connected future. And increasingly, we need to focus on the networks and their sustainability that make us connected. And then early next year, you'll also see us launch a category on health and well being wearables. This is in recognition that one of the incredibly horrible impacts that we're living through, COVID, has brought about a re realization about the value of wearable technology to make medicine, testing, and other, other programs available without us having to go to doctors. So we're going into a doctor's office. So we'll be focusing on health and well-being wearables. Next slide. But what I want to highlight for you, as well as EP, are some of the other programs that we make available to purchasers. I mentioned we're the Global Electronics Council. So one of the trainings that we're having in September, the fourth iteration of this, is for public purchasers in the EU. We also support purchasers in 42 countries. And here is an example of the training that we provide on how public purchasers globally can implement sustainability considerations in their procurements. Next slide. We're also very supportive of bringing purchasing power and its role in increasing sustainability to global scale. So this year we did launch the global campaign that really calls upon leading institutional purchasers, public and private sector, to actually commit to putting their technology spend, 100% of it, towards only credible, sustainable, and circular IT products and services. We were excited and absolutely honored to have, earlier this year, the organization Circular and Fair ICT Pact, which is a group of countries, including Austria, Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, join us to actually try to, again, get large-scale purchasers, both public and private sector, to only buy credible, sustainable IT products and services. It's my hope that next time we speak, I'll be able to add the country of United States to this list as well. Next slide. And if that's not enough, one of the things that we are doing as part of the campaign is launching a global purchaser network. Now, this is a network of networks, not individuals. This is where if you are part of a purchasing group and you want to find other purchasing groups who may be doing sustainable procurement, not only in IT, but in other spend categories, you can come here. And what will be the purpose of this network? Not only to allow others to find each other so that we can better aggregate our purchasing spend at global scale, but it's also to start recognizing when purchasers make the choice, and it is a choice, to buy credible sustainable IT, that they're actually having a tremendous impact at scale. And so to track which countries, which cities, which municipalities, and which companies are making this choice, and the fantastic positive impacts that they're having in making this choice, we've launched the Global Purchaser Network. Next slide. And of course, when you focus on the power of purchasing at scale and you focus on technology, one of the things that you can best impact is climate change. And so for this year, we're proud to be hosting event at COP26. 
which is a climate change event conference that the UN is putting on in Glasgow in November. And here again, we are celebrating the power of purchasing and we're bringing together a number of public and private sector interested parties where they themselves recognize, acknowledge, and commit to leveraging their purchasing power. So this gives you a little introduction of the Global Electronics Council, our EP Eco label, but also a number of other tools and resources and events that we are able to bring to you. With that, let me now bring it over to our moderator, Cindy. And I have to admit, I have known Cindy for more years than I care to say publicly on a webinar that's being recorded. But Cindy has had a long esteemed career in the government. She's currently the principal and founder of Valena Group. But before that, she was with the Office of Management and Budget. There she was a senior program analyst. And it was during that time that I actually got to meet her. And I have to tell you, she was, and she continues to be an incredibly tireless advocate for the role that the government can play in reducing costs, increasing the health and well being of communities nationwide, and increasing the resilience of our government and our communities. And she does that by recognizing the power of sustainability and advocating for it. And there are a small number of people who have been so instrumental in the federal space in making such a positive impact both for us as taxpayers, as community members, and within the tech sector as Cindy Valena. So it is with great honor that she agreed to host this, excuse me, to moderate <laughs> this webinar today. So Cindy, thank you so much. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Nancy, for those kind words. And it is true that I spent more than 30 years in the federal government trying to increase sustainable purchasing. So please, can I share a little history with you um, to tell you how EPEAT has been and continues to be a shining example of federal efforts to date? As you will learn today, the federal government now spends more than $650 billion a year on goods and services and has long been a leader in sustainable acquisitions, starting in the 1970s, a little before my time, when recycling and energy conservation first got first took hold. But then by 2006, the federal government was looking to increase uh, green purchasing beyond just the statutory uh, requirements for recycled and energy efficient products when EPA began exploring environmentally preferable product criteria and provided seed funding to establish the GEC, which turned out to promote electronic stewardship and help create the EP eco label. According to the GEC, the 1.33 billion EP registered products purchased worldwide since 2006 has resulted in reductions of 184 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, which is like taking more than 39 million cars off the road for a whole year. It saved 830,000 metric tons of hazardous waste, which is equivalent to the weight of 8,000 Boeing 757 jets, more than 208 million metric tons of primary materials, which is the same as the weight of over 2 million blue whales, and it saved 283 million megawatt hours of energy. Or you could say that, that every year EP purchases save enough electricity to supply 1.76 million households. That's more households than DC, Baltimore, Chicago, and Pittsburgh combined, just from buying more efficient electronics. And now more than ever, our government wants us to lead by example and recommit not only to past policies of buying energy efficient and environmentally preferable products, but also to advance new policies that will use the power of procurement to increase sustainability build in energy efficiency and resiliency, maximize recycling, buy American made, and increase security in our critical material supply chain. And along this journey to a more sustainable future, our first speaker, Leslie Field, 
has been a strong advocate for both sustainable acquisition and EP procurement. Leslie is the deputy administrator and currently the acting administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy at the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President. I believe she served in this acting role longer than most of the administrators combined. OFPP's role is to develop and implement government-wide policies to support the more than $650 billion in federal contracting each year. Prior to joining OMB, Leslie was a contracting officer at the U.S. Department of Transportation. She's a 2019 recipient of the Presidential Rank Award, which is one of the highest awards you can get in the federal government as a career federal servant, servant, a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration, and was recognized by FCW as their President's Award for 2017. She has a Bachelor of Science in Commerce from UVA, her Master's from Virginia Tech, and she completed the Senior Executive Fellows Program at JFK School of Government at Harvard. Thank you so much, Leslie, for joining us today, and welcome. Leslie, okay, Patty. great. Uh, now I think we got it. <laughs> Just let, can you hear me? I'm going to go with yes. That's great. Yes. Uh, so great. thank yes. thank you, Cindy, so much for that very warm welcome, and thank you all for inviting me here today. Uh, so the topic is great. It's the power of federal procurement, which I think is really fitting, given that we've been positioning procurement as a key driver in meeting the administration's priorities and a lot of other policy objectives. So we talk a lot about acquisition as a catalyst. Let me just give you some scale and scope numbers. So we spent over $600 billion in 2020, and we are the single largest purchaser in the entire world. We've got over 40,000 contracting officers and over 100,000 program managers and uh, contracting officer representatives. We have more than 3,000 buying offices, and we support more than 56 million transactions every year. So we are a major player. The US government can shift markets. We can also invest in new products and services that drive innovation, and we can signal changes in demand to the market at large as well. A good example of how we use this position is our category management effort, which has helped us to go to market as an informed and organized entity. So we're very well positioned to drive change through our category management solutions and through the relationships that we've built and the data that we've generated as we've built this transformational program. So for example, in our IT efforts, we of course include the appropriate energy savings and sustainability requirements. We've standardized on certain configurations so we have better demand signals and we take other steps to act more as a buying entity. So I think that's a really important um, signal that we send. And this effort has helped ensure that our contract requirements reflect important priorities, such as climate mitigation, so we can lead by example. But we also use acquisition as a catalyst for change in other administration priorities. So uh, advancing racial equity and supporting underserved communities, we're making sure that our business opportunities are widely available to new and diverse suppliers. There's a new goal set by the administration of 15% of eligible spending good going to small and disadvantaged businesses by 2026. We are creating conditions for promoting well-paying union jobs, such as our efforts that are being undertaken by our new Made in America office to build up our domestic suppliers and our domestic sources. This new office has been stood up to raise awareness and uh, to change some of the rules around uh, the content. And uh, you probably have seen the, uh, the new proposed rule to change some of the content requirements for domestic made goods. And we will also be increasing transparency of the waivers to help build some of those new markets. And of course, we're using this to tackle the climate crisis. Early on, this administration promoted urgency even referring to climate crisis instead of climate change. And two executive orders were issued in the first week mentioning climate and procurement. One of which, Executive Order 14008, or tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, laid out the administration's goal very directly. It is the policy of this administration to lead the nation's effort to combat the climate crisis by example, 
specifically by aligning the management of federal procurement and real property, public lands and waters and financial programs to support robust climate action. In May, another executive order 14030 related to climate related financial risks and led to the opening of two federal acquisition regulatory cases, minimizing the risk of climate change in federal acquisitions and uh, the advance notice of proposed rulemakings expected in the very near future, and the disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions and climate-related financial risk. In July, the Department of Defense issued a request for information, or RFI, regarding climate concerns and procurement, including greenhouse gas disclosures, supply chain greenhouse gas emissions, and supply chain risk management. And that RFI is currently open for comments through September 7th. And I encourage all of you to participate um, and comment. Just uh, search the docket number for DARS 2021-0014 in the Federal Register. Again, DARS 2021-0014 in the Federal Register. With climate change, the administration's priority is on both adaptation and mitigation. So adaptation, of course, is preparing ourselves to work and deliver in a world of increased extreme weather events and flooding and changes. And mitigation, again, uh, to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change by reducing emissions. Mitigation is working to reduce our emissions across government, including scope three or supply chain emissions through procurement. And adaptation is more of an acquisition planning and market research function whereby the acquisition workforce will need to work climate change risks into their current risk management considerations during the procurement, which is where we're learning a lot of lessons from our category management work. It's always best to include these, uh, these requirements up front and in conversations with our vendor community, both large and small. So it's a multi-pronged effort, it's not just procurement folks, but subject matter experts in risk, climate, architecture, program managers, contracting officer representatives, the whole team. And the call to action, this is really a special time and a defining moment. Contracting officers will have the ability to provide best long-term value for taxpayers by buying climate-friendly and sustainable products and services. This will help to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change. It'll benefit the environmental and human health. It allows the government to adapt to provide mission critical services in the face of climate change disruptions and it can create American jobs and lead in climate friendly products and services, which really are the future. As the administration's touch point for procurement policy, OFPP will continue to work with our colleagues to implement the administration's policies and other priorities, working closely with the White House's Council on Environmental Quality or CEQ, whose current Chief Sustainability Officer, Andrew Mayock, was the former deputy director for management at OMB. And because I've been there for a million years, I got to work with Andrew earlier. Um, and they've worked closely with OFPP and knows the role of and the value of federal procurement. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Cindy, thank you so much uh, for moderating. And I think we have time for a couple of questions. That would be great, Leslie. Um, one of the things I thought I'd ask is whether you think it's helpful for nonprofits like GEC or other, others that are out there to collect purchasing data and provide assistance in calculating the savings such as energy or carbon reduction from, from government purchases that they make. So absolutely. Um, so I will say one thing we've learned from category management is it's really important to have good conversations with folks who understand the market. Um, so we've done a lot more outreach. Uh, we've actually uh, really promoted through Mythbusters and through our industry liaisons, the outreach to not only the vendor community, but for nonprofits and folks who understand kind of the market better than we do. Uh, so I think in addition to the current and future requests for information from the public already mentioned, um, we really do rely on our vendor base to keep our workforce informed of market trends and capabilities. So by helping our contracting officers and the program managers understand both the energy savings and environmental benefits of the products and services offered, they can better request these products. So we can build it into our solicitations, we can build it into our source selection requirements, and we can build it into the acquisition process from beginning to end. So yes, it's, it's really important. That's a great question. Yes, great, thank you. And also, what do you think is the best way for the federal government uh, to partner with the CIO community to engage them more on, um, on reducing their climate impact or the climate impact of electronics that we're talking about? Absolutely. I think when we started category management, one of the first places we started was in IT. 
um, obviously because it's it's everywhere. And so I recently spoke to the CIO Council about the alignment with the CIO and the CIO priorities, and in particular about modernizing um, our acquisition and our IT and what that means for procurement. So I think by ensuring that the government is a leader in the acquisition space and purchasing hardware that is not only energy efficient, but accounts for the full life cycle costs, we can really better align our procurements with the administration priorities. I talked a little bit about um, category management. Um, we did just recently set up the IT VMO, which is the IT vendor management office over at GSA. And that really was to help us consolidate our acquisition intelligence. And we use that acquisition intelligence to make sure that we are going to market as an organized and informed entity. So I, I look forward to working with that office and our GSA colleagues and everybody who's involved with this, the CIO and the OFCIO, uh, to make sure that we're building all these requirements in upfront. Well said, great. That all sounds uh, great. And thank you for all this valuable information. And also thank you for your commitment. We look forward to watching OFPP be a major player in sustainable acquisition. So with that, I would, I'm excited to, and hope you are too, to hear from Dr. David Wadowski, who is the Director of Data Gathering and the Analysis Division in the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention at, at the EPA, at the Environmental Protection Agency. David provides leadership for EPA's mission focus on chemical safety and sustainability in the implementation laws such as Toxic Substance Control Act, the Pollution Prevention Act, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. His office leads several pollution prevention programs, including grants to states and tribes for working with businesses to promote source reduction and environmentally pre preferable purchasing program for federal procurement, of which EPA has been a success story. David is a graduate of the University of California with a Bachelor of Science in Political Economy of Natural Resources and in Plant and so Soil bio Biology. He obtained a master's from Colorado State University in Agricultural Economics and earned his PhD at Stanford in Applied and Development Economics. And he has been at EPA since 1998, serving in numerous leadership roles. Welcome, David, and thank you so much for your dedication and public service and for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Cindy. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk, as uh, uh, Cindy introduced, uh, the, um, uh, some of the stuff that we do in our portion of EPA in the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, implementing the Pollution Prevention Act. We have a few different activities, a number of different programs that are mandated by the Pollution Prevention Act, and one of those areas of responsibility is to provide technical assistance to federal agencies on engaging in source reduction and pollution prevention. And we do that through the Environmentally Preferable Purchasing Program uh, in, my, in my division. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And as a quick introduction, the Environmentally Preferable Purchasing Program, and not to alliterate too much, I might just say EPP, is a program that works in a landscape with a lot of other partners. And you've heard about some of those partners from Nancy, from Cindy, from Leslie, and we occupy a role in it as an enabling um, a tool and an, an, an enabling function, uh, even as we try to work with, for, and beside a lot of our partners. Next slide, please. So you've heard from um, uh, Cindy and you've heard from uh, Leslie about the size of federal purchasing. I realize I have to update my slide from 590 billion to 650 billion. I'm a little bit behind the times. And, and you can see from some of those, uh, some of those categories, uh, and Cindy mentioned some of those, the impact uh, of federal purchasing on the marketplace, as did Leslie. And what I wanted to, one of the things that I wanted to point out on this slide is our little footprint on the side where we use some of the badges and the uh, emblems uh, from the various federal agencies and organizations. And those sizes don't represent the size of their spend, but it's how it got to look like a footprint, is that there are networks and networks of networks. And one of the th things that Nancy mentioned is really important in sustainable procurement in the area of EP, but indeed across all federal purchasing and procurement is how do these networks work together? How do we take the mandates, the opportunities, the imperatives that Leslie was talking about and make those real? And how do we, and, and if we're not all going to operate in a vacuum, how do we share that information and make that work? And that's what I'm gonna talk about um, for the bulk of my talk, but I wanna just introduce a couple of other uh, ideas. Next slide, please. 
when we talk, we've heard from uh, Leslie uh, and Cindy and Nancy about the importance of federal sustainable purchasing as a tool to meet Biden-Harris administration priorities. And Leslie articulated those really well, so I don't have to go over some of those again. But when you look across the different types of activities and the different um, initiatives that we can pursue to address the climate crisis uh, and incentivize things like the materials and minerals or um, uh, 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 resources that would go into things like sustainable photoelectric panels, as Nancy was talking about earlier. There are a lot of different things that we can do and should do, and using federal procurement in order to effectuate market changes, market transformation, market commitments is a real leverage and a, and a levering opportunity for sustainable federal procurement. Next slide, please. And as what, 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 this is a little heuristic that kind of describes the, or at least a, is a visual for some of the uh, comments that we heard earlier, is that federal procurement is big, it's $650 billion, and it influences and can be a force multiplier for changes across the market. And Nancy was talking about that a little bit earlier. We influence state procurement officials and local government and municipal procurement and the private sector. And to the extent that we can help to establish the business case and establish the uh, market, or at least put a toe in the market to facilitate broader engagement and commitment to sustainable federal procurement. That's an important role that we play. And so we think about that, we act in that area, and we intend to not just federal procurement, but think about and act upon how we can be a force multiplier in our national marketplace and our global marketplace. Next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now talking about our Environmental Preferable Purchasing Program, our EPP program. Uh, we do a lot of different things from working on standards uh, to engaging the private sector uh, and assisting other feds, as I mentioned. And one of the things are the tools that we bring to the table to help our network of networks amongst federal agencies to identify and to procure sustainable products and services is through recommendations for specifications, standards, and eco-labels. And I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna go into a little bit of depth in that next slide, please. So when we look about, you know, what are the opportunities and how do we use specification standards and eco-labels, why? Next slide, please. So there's a, a lot of reasons why we would think about and use specification standards and eco-labels. Uh, one is that they are available now. EP is a great example of that. There are a lot of others in the marketplace that attend to other attributes, other purchase categories um, of, uh, of products and services and the environmental impacts or the benefits of sustainability amongst those environmental dimensions. So. A standard or an eco-label can look at multiple attributes, can look at greenhouse gases, climate crisis issues, as well as toxics, can look at the life cycle of that product or service through circularity uh, and, and looking across from uh, essential resource extraction to the cradle to cradle phenomenon that's going on. It can simplify complex environmental issues for purchasers. Uh, I didn't take note, I, I didn't write down, let's say, how many contracting officers and procurement officials there are across the federal government, but it was tens of thousands uh, of folks. And if everybody had to do their own analysis, it would be very challenging. And so a lot of what we do is to try to build tools to make getting to sustainability an easier process. And so by providing a market-based, multi-stakeholder and collaborative approach, we can address some of those emerging environmental issues and put those tools for making those selections and procurement decisions in the hands of the procurement officials. Next slide, please. So when we start to look then at the global marketplace for eco-labels, it can be overwhelming. Any of us can go into a local supermarket and start to see all the labels that are out there. Right now, we've counted at last count 460 in the marketplace, and I'm sure there's more. Um, but one of the challenges that federal officials or federal procurement officials have when looking at a product or spend category is how do you wade through potentially multiple eco-labels or standards for a specific spend or purchase category. Next slide, please. So what we've done through our environmentally preferable purchasing program is to bring a tool and a technique to try to identify and filter out the credible, verifiable eco-labels, sustainable eco-labels, uh, specifications and standards that are associated with a particular product or service. And there's two ways that we've done that. 
One is looking at the work of another federal agency, and we'll hear from Sky uh, in just a few minutes on what, they, what, what they've been wor working on in the Department of Energy with the uh, Federal Emergency, um, Energy Management Program. What we've also done is develop a framework that we and other agencies and other organizations can use to evaluate eco-label standards and specifications for their veracity around the areas of sustainability and how those eco-labels are managed. And through that process, we can narrow down that really crowded global marketplace for eco-labels into those that we consider relevant for federal purchasing that we can then rely on in developing recommendations. So let's go into the next slide, please. And so we've currently got in the EPP program for federal purchasers, which is widely available on the web to any procurement official, again, in the state, local uh, um, governments and private sector, are standards and eco labels for um, 25 different product categories. It doesn't cover everything and we're trying to grow that uh, and we're working with other federal agencies to do that. We recommend 48 private sector standards and eco labels and three specifications. And so what that does, it helps federal procurement officials when they are looking at either developing contracts or looking at registries or catalogs to identify which of those eco labels, uh, standards and specifications are relevant to a particular product or service. Next slide, please. So the product categories that we uh, currently have recommendations for those 25 fall into seven different uh, categories we've identified in cafeteria construction. Buildings is a huge portion of what uh, the federal government spends on, office furniture, custodial. Uh, electronics is one of those areas that <laughs> brought, bring us here today, and there are millions and millions of purchases that happen every year in the electronics category. And so having credible and verifiable ECHO label, the uh, EP label, makes that a lot easier for federal procurement officials to identify which kind of products and services are available to them and make that um, procurement decision quicker, easier, more effective, money saving, uh, and uh, environmentally appropriate. Next slide, please. So one of the things that uh, when we're thinking about uh, the climate crisis and how the recommendations are addressing climate and other related impacts, uh, that's certainly, you know, as, as Leslie mentioned earlier, a priority uh, for the globe, for the nation, and certainly for the Biden House administration. Where the, in the current standards and eco-labels, some of them are associated, um, you know, with, we, we can look at the um, uh, generation of the greenhouse gases or uh, mitigating those through the generation of energy, and that's where some other folks in the federal government and in EPA work. When we're looking at the production of products and services, looking at that life cycle approach that I mentioned earlier, we can identify there, whether or not a standard specification or eco label is addressing renewable energy, energy efficiency, obviously, you know, very important. Process chemicals used in some of those um, uh, manufacturing processes can be very powerful uh, greenhouse gases. And then we can also look at recycled content, right sizing, transport, and shipping, which have an impact on uh, transportation uh, emissions and uh, climate effects. And refurbishment and reuse helps mitigate or minimize remanufacturing and new manufacturing, again, which can generate more greenhouse gases. And all of these, you know, across these suite, as we look at and we evaluate eco labels, these are important considerations to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So when we talk about networks of networks, you know, and how do we how do we how do we work within the federal family? Uh, working with GSA uh, is uh, incredibly important. Uh, and Nancy's a, a former home uh, in the federal government. Um, we work with Department of Energy. We're going to hear, uh, I said in just a few minutes, Department of Defense and a number of different other federal organizations. What we do is we share the recommendations, standards and equal labels information. We listen, we hear, we look at um, a category management and try to identify what more we could be doing and managing and monitoring the purchasing uh, of uh, sustainable and environmentally preferable products and services is part of what we're doing when we're sharing information and we're sharing tools and we're sharing successes. But it's not just limited to the federal government. Next slide, please. A lot of what uh, we're seeing more and more is that force mul false multiplier effect going on uh, amongst uh, other organizations, 
uh, that are themselves networks of networks that uh, share information with procurement officials. Uh, we're seeing it amongst uh, large organizations that provide grants or work internationally. And we're seeing that more and more that states themselves and local governments are adopting and counting and referencing the work that we do to help guide and provide insight into how to make those procurement decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Um, we've already heard uh, about the kind of uh, the uh, the overall uh, impact of the environmental impact of aggregate of uh, the use of and the purchase of uh, EP products uh, globally. I just uh, grabbed um, a table here uh, that represents one year in 2018 when the federal government procured approximately uh, 7 million um, uh, electronic uh, products. And the, the, the table shows from worldwide, you know, for the 181 million that were purchased in 2018, estimated again by the Global Electronics Council, uh, what some of those energy um, and materials and hazardous waste impacts are gonna be. When we talk about what is the business case for this, just a, you know, bottom line, when we look at the cost savings to the federal government of making those sustainable choices for electronic products, 183 million taxpayer dollars saved in, 19, in 2018 by focusing and choosing EP certified products is a pretty powerful message around what is the business case and what is the, uh, in addition to the environmental impacts and those important environmental impacts, how we make the business case for sustainable procurement and the power of federal procurement. Next slide, please. So one of the things I just wanted to share a little bit is that we're very proud to have worked with the Global Electronics Council. Uh, you know, in a, uh, earlier in life, the Green Electronics Council helping to stand it up uh, in the early 2000s. Our teams, uh, team and teams across EPA work with GEC on in the standards development process, on working groups, participate in the, uh, the GEC's uh, EP Advisory Council. And, when we, and then we are also working with uh, some of our colleagues in, across the federal agencies uh, and the White House in providing technical assistance to fe uh, other federal agencies in meeting those requirements that, Leslie ta that we, we've talked about earlier on procuring EP registered products. And what we do within uh, EPA and within the federal government is to help coordinate engagement and work with GEC on EP. Uh, and we're very excited about those new product categories, Nancy, that you're gonna be introducing in the near future. So we're, we're, we're certainly keeping our uh, uh, eyes, ears, and uh, hands open waiting to receive some of that information. Next slide, please. So we already talked about a little bit about the um, um, uh, mandate for federal acquisition. Uh, Leslie talked about uh, some of the way the policies get implemented. Um, this is just a slide uh, to show you know, that references those federal acquisition regulations uh, that identify uh, EP and sustainable electronics products um, and the some of the benefits are associated with that. Next slide. So as we think about moving forward, some of the things that I just wanted to share, things that are on my radar screen uh, that we're thinking about, talking about, and trying to act upon is looking at critical minerals. So there are national security issues associated with critical minerals. There are certain environmental uh, implications uh, for um, uh, reducing our reliance on, on critical minerals. And as we think about then also the recovery of those materials uh, more and more uh, have been that we're, we're, we're looking at how can we influence through standard specifications and eco-labels the design of products to either minimize or recover those critical minerals and are there greener chemistry techniques that we can use or that are available uh, amongst uh, innovators and technology innovators to either substitute for critical minerals or to facilitate the recovery separation and reuse of those materials uh, from products uh, that are um, that depend on those critical minerals minerals we're looking more and more at carbon reduction targets and so you know nancy was talking earlier about uh, the importance of not only having photovoltaics and solar capacity but making sure that those uh, products are sustainable themselves opportunities for improving energy efficiency is always going to be in the center of our uh, radar screen i mentioned earlier that in certain production practices in electronics, high potential greenhouse gases are used and looking at opportunities uh, to reduce a substitute 
uh, or replace uh, some of those materials and those greenhouse gases in the electronics production practices are something we're very interested in exploring. We want to continue transparency. I mentioned uh, registries is very important as a way to um, uh, convey amongst the uh, echo labels where the um, uh, where where to find those materials and products. And recognition is very important, and those award programs and publicizing that. So with that. I think I'm done. I think we might be running short on time. There's a couple of questions, but maybe we should move on to Sky. I'm going to leave it in your hands, Cindy, on how to proceed. Oh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Okay. I would like to ask you, like I asked Leslie, um, if you think it's helpful for the nonprofits uh, to collect some data and provide assistance in calculating uh, savings, and then also whether or not EPA does its own data tracking or, or collect or tracking of savings i'm guessing you do since you had all that data yes we do we i mean we we developed a um a, a electronics benefit calculator that the gc has now that now stewards uh and, and shares with folks um the um development of the collection and the reporting of data is incredibly important for all the reasons that leslie mentioned from our kind of my own parochial where i sit uh, it's important because we're trying to identify where we need to make or should be making investments. I talked about some of those. We have 25 product categories. There's more that we need to be investing in. We may dig deeper. We may be looking at additional opportunities depending on uh, spend categories and environmental benefits on how to, you know, where where we might be providing some insight and advice into taking eco labels, standards and specifications even further uh, into um, sustainable uh, dimensions. So I think that we we use that information in a lot of different ways, both in making investments, uh, directing our program, uh, and engaging networks and stakeholders in effectuating kind of the improvements that we would be uh, looking for using those data. Great. And also, can I ask, what kind of awareness and training efforts does EPA provide or have plans to enhance and improve sustainable acquisition across government right thank you so we we are planning uh, and we uh, engage in training on we do one-on-one -on -one and agency to agency we participate in a federal environmental symposium an annual symposium amongst federal uh, uh, organizations and entities to um, uh, identify and promote uh, environmental goals amongst federal agencies and we're more and more working with the private sector with those networks of networks, those entities and organizations that do work with folks outside our direct uh, federal family, uh, and we're working uh, with uh, in more and more with local governments and businesses. And so that training uh, and those kind of activities, uh, we're trying to customize those uh, increasingly because there are some folks who are engaging in procurement in different ways, some writing contracts, some doing direct procurements, some doing group buying, and Nancy mentioned earlier, kind of the networks of networks. And so training is important. Uh, and if there are folks uh, out there, uh, either on this uh, webinar or another um, context who are interested in training, uh, please you know, feel free to reach out to me uh, and, I, and we'll connect you with some folks because the training leads to procurement <laughs> and helps to facilitate those decisions and those positive decisions that people can make. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your staff works tirelessly on a lot of the interagency groups, um, helping us develop, helping develop more training and awareness. So we appreciate that. So thank you, you so do. much. For your time You're today. welcome. Thank you, everybody. And now I we will we will hear from Skylar Shell from the Department of Energy's Federal Energy Management Program, which is housed in EERE Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Division at DOE. At BEMPS, sorry, uh, Sky uh, supervises procurement services and distributed generation services, and a whole lot more. BEMP is responsible for assisting federal agencies in their efforts to achieve energy and, of course, cost savings from efficiency, resiliency, and decarbonization in their facilities. Sky's role includes overseeing the management of performance contracting tools such as ESPCs and UESCs, design and technical assistance, tools, training and outreach, quality assurance, and the Energy Efficient Product Procurement Program, which you'll talk about today. Prior to joining DOE in 2001, Sky served as a leading government-sponsored enterprise in housing finance, and before that, 
He was vice president for secondary marketing and product development for a Dallas-based mortgage company and the director of government relations for a DC trade association. He holds a BS in economics from State University of New York at Albany and a master's of planning degree from the School of Architecture at UVA, again, another Virginian. Thank you, Sky. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, thank you, Cindy. And uh, I think I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing you about 20 of your 30 years. I think I probably met you uh, the first day on the job in the federal government. I also want to thank uh, Nancy and the Global uh, Electronics Council for their work supporting uh, progress in uh, sustainable acquisition and uh, the the EP to Eco label, and for hosting this this conference. It's a very important uh, topic. In terms of the power of uh, federal uh, procurement, uh, the federal government does have a lot of power—power power to uh, to lead by example and uh, to drive down costs. David uh, showed some uh, excellent uh, slides relative to the cost uh, savings potential, and also to lead in driving uh, down greenhouse gases uh, through uh, uh, you know correct purchasing decisions. Um, the uh, the huge purchasing uh, that the federal government does in terms of uh, the first cost for all this acquisition is certainly you know gigantic but if if any of the items that we're purchasing uses energy then uh, that's really just the tip tip of the iceberg and it's the life cycle cost of, of that equipment and its use of energy over time that is really critical and FEMP has uh, put a good deal of focus on trying to help the federal government identify and purchase, uh, the equipment that will provide the best life cycle cost um, uh, results for the government over time. Next slide. Okay, and if uh, next next slide, it's just an overview of federal sustainable acquisition. Uh, it really covers a lot of ground, as you can imagine. Uh, on the bottom of this chart, you see sustainable travel. There are a variety of services uh, that the government uh, needs to focus on in terms of uh, making sustainable decisions around janitorial services, construction, uh, operations. The energy we buy uh, can be uh, made more sustainable you know, through uh, renewable energy. The fuel that we uh, buy for fuels uh, for vehicles, the types of vehicles uh, that we use uh, is very important to focus on, as well as green building. and uh, and, and products, uh, particularly uh, energy using products, which is, is our, our focus. Next slide. And if you could uh, load the next slide. Okay, the, uh, there's a variety of programs that support sustainable acquisition uh, in terms of material composition, the uh, bio-based program with USDA, recycled content with EPA, environmentally preferred products, um, alternatives to ozone depleting substances, and of course, EPEAT. And then uh, looking at life cycle cost effective, and the area I'm gonna focus on today is the FEMP designated products, as well as FEMP low standby uh, power products, as well as Energy Star certified, water sense, EPEAT. And then finally, uh, when uh, agencies focus on uh, disposal and reuse, there are um, uh, tools and support uh, relative to that. And again, EPEAT uh, is a notable uh, contributor to that. Next slide. Okay, the, um, the focus on uh, energy efficient products has uh, a legislative basis, uh, 42 U.S. Code 8259B uh, describes uh, FEMP's, um, FEMP's program in terms of uh, identifying designated uh, products that uh, are basically um, uh, products that uh, are the in the top 25 percent of, uh, of efficiency in that uh, in that sector it describes the uh, federal government's uh, need to uh, to specify energy efficient products in their uh, in their acquisitions and it also includes a requirement that FEMP maintain a list of uh, low standby power equipment as well. Next slide. Now further um, you know, regulatory direction, DOE basically uh, needs to make it clear to agencies which product, products are energy efficient. Uh, remind them that they, they need to buy those products 
and um, and also uh, you know to help uh, monitor uh, monitor that acquisition. Next slide. Okay, um, BEMP uh, basically provides uh, uh, information, data, uh, tools that um, enable agencies to you know, basically search uh, different product categories like lighting, appliances, commercial food service, heating and cooling, IT, and electronics uh, in order to identify the uh, top efficient products. Uh, our uh, website, uh, uh, also provides information on uh, Energy Star to help agencies uh, uh, basically find the uh, you know the correct uh, uh, guidelines for the many different products that uh, they may be uh, considering purchasing. Uh, FEMP also provides tools. Uh, getting back to the economic input of these uh, impact of these uh, decisions uh, that help agencies understand the uh, the, the dollar uh, benefit for um, investing not only in the EEPP uh, required product, but also if they uh, invest in a higher efficient product, the types of savings that uh, that decision can make over the life cycle of the equipment. Next slide. Okay, this is a screenshot of our, our webpage. And I do encourage people to go to our webpage and to, uh, and to explore this. Uh, this is uh, showing a number of our covered uh, product categories and fluorescent uh, ballasts, um, as well as uh, LED uh, luminaires. And um, it also shows uh, products that are covered by uh, Energy Star. It provides information to the right in terms of, uh, of the benefits of the, uh, uh, of the high efficient uh, products. And um, hopefully you'll find it a useful tool. Next slide. It's been mentioned by, I think David mentioned the importance of uh, recognition. Um, training is, is also important because you know, the, the whole success in acquisition relates to uh, informing people and motivating people uh, to you know, strive to help the government buy you know, the, the most sustainable and the, and the most uh, energy efficient uh, products. Uh, FEMP is a, a big fan of recognition programs. We have a, a major federal-wide recognition program for energy management, and uh, DOE itself also has a, a Green Buy Award program that is focused on, on sustainable acquisition. Uh, we encourage uh, all agencies to have these uh, sorts of programs, and if you're contemplating it and would like uh, FEMP uh, you know, support uh, on uh, uh, thinking through these programs, please feel free to, to contact us. Next slide. Okay, this is, um, and next slide. And keep going. I think there's one more, excellent. Uh, this is just a summary. The uh, sustainable products, uh, you know, are critically important to the federal government. And, uh, you know, they relate to a lot of topics such as material, a composition in their development, their disposal, the life cycle cost um, over the life of these products, which is significant. Many of these uh, energy related products that we're putting in place will last 10, 15, 20, uh, 30 years. And making those energy aware choices at the acquisition point is critically important, not only for saving money, but also for helping uh, the government reduce greenhouse gases. Our focus at FEMP is in the uh, energy and water conservation, uh, reducing carbon emissions, uh, saving uh, costs over the life cycle. And we encourage you to explore FEMP's website and other resources. We have tools that uh, will help you, uh, you know, make the best uh, purchase decision around this equipment. And uh, you know, please uh, contact us uh, if you'd like any uh, um, additional technical assistance in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Sky. That was great. Um, I know FEMP has lots of awareness and training efforts, but do you have any plan to enhance and improve sustainable acquisition coming that we should know about? Well, 
um, you know, we do have a good deal of, tra of training that is available uh, to everyone, to the world. Uh, it is focused on the, the federal sector. Uh, if you go to the whole building design guide, uh, you'll find many uh, training resources uh, that, uh, that FEMP has uh, provided. Um, we update those, uh, those resources uh, frequently. There's on-demand, there's live. We also host uh, conferences such as the uh, Energy Exchange. Uh, where we try to uh, provide information on the latest uh, and greatest uh, topics across uh, energy management and acquisition. So there are a lot of resources and we do encourage people uh, to go in and explore. Uh, we do have CEUs uh, after taking the course, taking the test, uh, uh, folks can get the CEUs if that's of interest to them. And if they have ideas on uh, other topics that they'd like us to explore, you know, please let us know. We, are, we try to be responsive uh, in particular to the federal government and trying to meet their needs for information, uh, tools, training. Thank you. And um, I would also like to ask uh, whether FEMP uh, does track government purchasing progress and do you have any data that you can share on compliance? Yeah, the government does uh, you know, provide the reporting on uh, acquisition. It does uh, uh, get rolled up into agency scorecards, uh, but FEMP, you know, specifically is engaged in reviewing uh, uh, solicitations and uh, monitoring agency compliance uh, with the, uh, the, requ the requirement to put in uh, a language uh, relating to uh, energy efficient uh, product procurement in their solicitations. Uh, we are now looking at how best to convey uh, the results of our analysis uh, to the individual uh, contracting officers uh, that are um, that are uh, managing those acquisitions, as well as agency management, so that they can see programmatically uh, what we're seeing relative to compliance with um, with these requirements. Great, great. I love supporting the FAMP mission, as you know. I love the Energy Exchange. I think it's a great uh, annual training venue. If you haven't been there and you're in the federal government, you should definitely check it out. And um, so thank you, Sky. And before we bring back all our speakers to thank them for their time today and for helping us learn more about federal sustainability practices and actions, let me leave you with some important facts about GEC and EP registered eco label. One, GEC is a mission-driven, not-for-profit that collaborates with industry and government to achieve more sustainable electronic pr products and services. GEC never rests on its laurels. It keeps moving forward toward more innovative products based on more efficient resource use, a more so socially responsible supply chain, recyclability, and the ability to recapture critical and rare earth materials. Just this year, it issued a new purchaser's guide on addressing labor and human rights impacts in technical procurements. You heard Leslie saying that is a new emphasis or uh, something that the administration wants to focus on. And this uh, purchaser's guide was in addition to one it already issued on um, sustainability and cloud service procurements. Um, these guides contain valuable information um, that is translatable to other types of procurements to, to align with the Biden-Harris administration priorities. GEC has a great website. It's down, here it is below me, um, which includes their online registry where you can find all their product listings. And we've learned today they cover computers, monitors, servers, copiers, as well as TVs and solar panels. And then the eco, EP eco label was the first tiered eco label that I know of denoting bronze, silver, gold levels for how much environmentally preferable criteria a product meets. EP requires third-party validation of product claims and therefore provides greater credibility to purchasers who use it. EP registered pr products are trusted, competitive, innovative, and save valuable energy and money, not to mention the Earth's climate. And EP, as we heard from the EPA, EP purchasing has saved the federal government alone more than $183 million in um, cost savings since it's, uh, I don't know if that was one year or the, since its inception, but I think um, $183 million is nothing to sneeze at. That was one year, Cindy. Oh, great. 
Right. So that's a lot of savings that the government needs and could be spending on better things. And let me just close with a reminder uh, about what an important tool EPEAT has become for impacting energy efficiency, environmentally preferable, recycled, bio-preferred, and waste prevention. A recommitment to electronic stewardship from all purchasers, especially the federal government, can help mitigate climate exchange changes across the globe, reduce electronic waste, and drive everyone to be responsible stewards of our natural and electronic resources, as well as educate our workforces. So let's do it. Make sure the next time you buy an electronic, it's an EP registered one. And now let's have all our speakers back and say thank you so much for all of your effort and for the valuable information that you provided. I hope it helps agencies recommit to looking at these areas when they purchase. Thank you. <laughs> hey. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great day.